Hello guys, welcome to another lesson in Unit 3 Chemistry in Society. Today we are moving on to talk about fertilisers. Now fertilisers are added to soil to increase the fertility and to boost plant growth. Now they do so by providing plants with the essential elements that they need in order to grow. They are very important for ensuring the food demand for 7 billion people is met and unfortunately at the moment Natural fertilisers, such as manure or compost, are not enough to meet the worldwide demand for food. For that reason, chemists play an important role in ensuring there's enough food for a growing population by making synthetic fertilisers in the chemical industry. So before we move on, it's important to note that fertilisers, which are added to soil to increase fertility, can be natural or man-made. Natural fertilisers come from manure and compost and we are going to learn a bit more today about man-made synthetic fertilisers. So first of all let's clarify what the essential elements for plants are. So plants need nutrients in the form of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, N, P and K. Now these are essential elements for plant growth. Each different plant needs different quantities of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium to grow, but it is important that when we provide these elements to the plant, they must be soluble. When we talk about soluble, it means they'll dissolve in water, and in so doing, they'll be able to be absorbed by the plant through its roots. Compounds containing ions such as the nitrate ion, the phosphate ion, ammonium ion and potassium ion can be used in synthetic fertilisers providing they are water soluble. As we've said, they have to be water soluble so that they can be absorbed by the plant. However, this does come with some drawbacks, particularly in a country like Britain, where we experience a high level of rain. These fertilisers can be washed out of the soil and into lakes and rivers where they contaminate the water that they end up in, causing things like algal bloom and destroying the natural life in the rivers and ponds. However, in order to sustain our rapidly growing world population, we are coming to rely on synthetic fertilisers. So synthetic fertilisers are made in labs. They are mass produced to tailor to the needs of a variety of plants. And as I've said before, different plants require these essential elements in different proportions. So for example, what we have here is a range of different fertilisers. Ammonium nitrate um, only contains nitrogen of the three essential elements. Ammonium phosphate contains two of them. Potassium nitrate contains potassium and nitrogen, but not phosphorus. Ammonium sulfate again only contains nitrogen. And urea again only contains nitrogen. Now that is not to say that plants only need nitrogen. They need all three elements, N, P and K, in different quantities. However, depending on the soil, it might be necessary to boost a plant supply of one or two over the other. So what do these three elements actually do for plants? Well, nitrogen actually helps with leaf development and it will make your plants green. If you were to apply it to um, grass in your garden, you would find it increases how green the grass is. Phosphorus is important for root growth and if plants did not have their roots they would not be able to absorb the nutrients that they need um, to grow and to survive so root growth and development is incredibly important. Potassium is important for disease resistance and just like us plants being living things have to contend with harmful viruses, bacteria and fungus. Potassium helps them to develop disease resistance and it is also important and root development too. Now if you were so inclined and you decided that you wanted to grow your own plants and develop your own garden and you went to a garden centre to buy fertilisers to um, help your plants grow, 
there are numbers on the back of fertilizer which give percentages for how much nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium are present in your fertilizer. For example, 1648 would mean 16% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus and 8% potassium. Now where do they get those percentages from? We actually get it from calculating the, calculating, sorry, the percentage composition. So the percentage of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium in a particular fertiliser can be calculated using the formula. Remember, the percentage of your chosen element is calculated by taking the mass of your element in the formula divided by the mass of one mole multiplied by 100. For example, we are given the percentage composition of nitrogen in ammonium nitrate. So the mass of N in the formula is 28. We have two nitrogen atoms, one here and one there. They have a, gram, a formula mass of 14. 14 times 2 is 28. And when we add the formula masses of each of these elements together, we get 80. So it's 28 divided by 80 multiplied 100 tells us that in ammonium nitrate, 35% of the mass is made of nitrogen. And that is how we get to those percentages on the side of a fertilizer packet. So on booklet page 21, you have this table. Now what it shows you is a range of different fertilizers from fission, fissons, sorry, deep feed to B&Q liquid tomato feed gives you an example of what they're used for and the proportions of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium in each. What I advise you to do just now is pause the video where you are, turn to page 21 or if you're um, working through an online document, open it up and get this table filled in. Now, of the three essential elements, nitrogen is actually the easiest one to come across. It makes up 78% of the air that we breathe in. And in fact, plants such as peas, beans and clovers have developed a method of being able to fix the nitrogen in the air and absorb it through their roots. They do this through special nodules on the roots which contain bacteria called nitrogen fixing bacteria. Now what nitrogen fixing bacteria do is they are able to extract nitrogen from the air and use it for plant growth. Now only leguminous plants or legumes can do this. And not all plants that we use in food production are legumes. And unfortunately chemists who are making synthetic fertilizers are also not leguminous creatures. So that means that we have had to develop methods of fixing nitrogen for ourselves in order to make synthetic fertilizers. Now the man who was able to fix nitrogen in the lab was this gentleman here called Fritz Haber and in 1908 he managed to successfully fix nitrogen from the atmosphere in his laboratory and he did so by making the compound that we know as ammonia and what this facilitated was the mass production of synthetic chemicals and the development of intensive agriculture. Now up until this point agriculture had really depended upon the use of natural fertilizers and a crop rotation system. Now, as I've said before, different plants require a specific quantity of each of the essential nutrients. By rotating each crop around in a system, what it tried to prevent was the leaching of all the essential nutrients from the soil. Now, because the population began to boom, we needed a more intensive way of providing food to meet an increased demand and Fritz Haber 
his ability to fix nitrogen in the lab and make ammonia made this possible. So just before we move on to talk in more detail about the Haber-Bosch process, a couple of interesting little things about Fritz Haber himself. Now, he said, during peacetime, a scientist belongs to the world, but during wartime, he belongs to his country. Now, in 1908, the world was at peace, and this development, this ability to fix atmospheric nitrogen in the laboratory, benefited people all over the world. However, during wartime, Fritz Haber was heavily involved in the development and the use of chemical weapons. And in fact, he was heavily involved in the use of chlorine gas as a weapon. He developed masks and other protective equipment for the German soldiers and went so far as to actually be on the ground at the Second Battle of Ypres when chlorine was first used against the Allied forces. So he's quite an interesting man, is Fritz Haber. So the Haber-Bosch process, just how did Fritz Haber manage to get nitrogen from the air and combine it with hydrogen to make ammonia? Now nitrogen in the form of soluble nitrates is the best way to get nitrogen into a plant. And the first step towards making synthetic nitrates was made by Fritz Haber and involves the production of ammonia. Now it's called the Haber process or you might hear it called the Haber-Bosch process and as you already know it's named after Fritz Haber and a man called Karl Bosch. Now Fritz Haber was the man who used his chemistry knowledge to make the reaction between nitrogen and hydrogen happen and Karl Bosch was the brains behind scaling up the process to make it possible on an industrial level. Now, the process of making ammonia uses the raw materials nitrogen and hydrogen. This is what we start off with. And in the process, nitrogen from air and hydrogen, which is obtained from natural gas, are reacted together under very specific conditions to form ammonia gas. Now, this double-headed arrow here represents a reversible reaction. The forward reaction, which means moving from left to right, produces ammonia. And a reverse reaction, from right to left, produces nitrogen and hydrogen. The ammonia produced in the Haber process is used to make nitric acid, and it is this nitric acid which is used to make soluble salts that can be used in fertilisers. And we're going to learn a bit more about that in the next lesson. But first, how did Fritz Haber make this reaction happen? So the industrial production of ammonia is designed in such a way to give the best yield of ammonia. And in order to achieve this best yield, Haber found that controlling temperature, pressure and the addition of a catalyst were vitally important. Now in the case of ammonia production, if you have an extremely high temperature, this will favour the reverse reaction. It will cause any ammonia you've made to return back to nitrogen and hydrogen. To stop this from happening, but still have the temperature high enough to ensure a fast reaction, we use a moderate temperature of 450 degrees centigrade. And that gives a reasonable yield of ammonia. In the case of ammonia, a high pressure reaction favours the forward reaction. So high pressure systems will force nitrogen and hydrogen to react together and form ammonia. The problem with this though is that a high pressure in an industrial setting is very expensive to maintain. So instead we use a pressure of around 200 atmospheres which is moderate enough to ensure that we have a reasonable yield of ammonia. 
Lastly, we use an iron catalyst to speed up the reaction and increase the yield of ammonia. Now the iron that is used is finely divided, so the particle size is very small, to create a large surface area for the reaction to take place. Now as the iron is a solid and the reactants are gases, we would call the catalyst heterogeneous. And this means that the reactant and the catalyst are in different states. Reactants are gases and the catalyst is a solid. So let's summarise that. The best yield of ammonia requires a moderate temperature of 450 degrees centigrade, a pressure of around about 200 atmospheres and an iron catalyst. So if you were to turn to page 22 of your booklet, you are given this flow diagram for the Haber process. Now if we go up here, we can see nitrogen and hydrogen are fed into a compressor. The gases are then passed into a catalyst chamber containing iron. The product from there it moves on to the condenser out of which ammonia is filtered, it's produced from the condenser. Any nitrogen and hydrogen that have found their way into the condenser are recycled back into the catalyst chamber. So on page 22 you have the following questions. You are first asked to write the word and balanced formula equation for the Haber process. Where do the raw materials for the reaction come from? What is the name of the catalyst used in the Haber process? And what type of catalyst is this? Now these are all things that I have just said. So pause the video here, have a go at those questions and we'll go through the answers in just a second. If you need, you can put the video back so that you can see the text from the past two slides. Those should help you answer these questions. So, write the word and balance formula equation for the Haber process. Now remember, you should be using in both the word and formula equation this double-headed arrow to remind us that it is a reversible reaction. So our word equation is nitrogen plus hydrogen gives ammonia, which is N2 plus 3H2 gives 2NH3. Where do the raw materials come from? Well, the nitrogen comes from the air and the hydrogen comes from methane. I'll also accept natural gas. What does the double-headed arrow in the equation mean? I've already spoiled that question. It means the reaction is reversible. What is the name of the catalyst used in the Haber process? The catalyst is iron. And what type of catalyst is this? The catalyst is heterogeneous, a different state to the reactants. Now on booklet page 23, we have this graph and it shows the conversion to ammonia under different conditions. It shows different temperatures across a range of pressures. So if the conditions are 200 atmospheres at 400 degrees, what yield of ammonia is obtained? So what we have to do is we have to find 200 atmospheres and go up to the line that is on the 400 degrees graph, take it across to the side and it gives us a yield of 40%. What is the effect on the yield of ammonia of increasing the pressure? Well, as we already discussed, 
the forwards reaction, the production of ammonia, is favoured by a high pressure. So if we increase the pressure, we increase the yield of ammonia. So if that's the case, why is a higher pressure not used for the industrial production of ammonia? Well, that is because high pressures are expensive to operate. So what happens, let's talk about something else. What is the effect on the yield of ammonia if you decrease the temperature? Well, decreasing the temperature increases the yield of ammonia. As we've said before, a really high temperature favours the conversion of ammonia back into nitrogen and hydrogen. So a lower pressure will increase the yield of ammonia. And we don't do this, and we wouldn't do the industrial process. So you might be wondering, why don't we carry out the process at an even lower temperature? And that is because too low a temperature would slow the rate of reaction down. Now one of the issues with this process is that too high a temperature favours your reverse reaction. So all your ammonia that you make is converted back to nitrogen and hydrogen. But too low a temperature slows down the rate of reaction and in fact you get much less ammonia produced for the amount of money you're investing to make it. So it's not a financially feasible method of carrying out reaction. What you should do now is you should turn to page 64 of your white CGP workbook and work through the pages on the Haber process. Once you have done that, there are two worksheets on the Haber process. Worksheet 1, making ammonia. And worksheet 2, shown here. And you should complete them before the next lesson. So that takes us to the end of our first lesson on fertilisers. What I would like you to do now is make sure that your notes are complete up to page 23 of your pupil booklet. And if you could complete the CGP worksheet as well as the worksheet 1 and worksheet 2 shown at the end of this video. I will make sure that they are available to you through Teams and we will aim to go over the answer to those at the start of the next lesson. Thank you for tuning in again guys and I will see you all in the next one. Bye everyone!